Hello and welcome to the Outcomes Over Hours show. I'm Tina Patterson and I'm really delighted with the guest I have here today, Brian Poppy. So Brian is the Senior Vice President of Income and Wealth Planning at the at Mutual of Omaha, which is a Fortune 300 organisation. He's held several executive roles previously, roles such as Chief Data Officer, uh, SVP of Technology Modernization, VP of Innovation Strategy, as well as VP of Enterprise Risk Management. An additional role he holds, which I absolutely love, is that Brian is the executive sponsor of the Emerging Leaders Network at Mutual. So Brian, welcome to the Outcomes Over Hours show. Yeah, thanks, Tina. I'm super happy to be here. Fantastic. Well, I'd love for you to share with listeners about your own leadership style and particularly how it has changed throughout the course of your career. And particularly, you've held some pretty different roles. Also, if you think about um, innovation strategy, tech, data, I'd love to hear about how your leadership style has evolved. Yeah. So, boy, I got to give a talk to uh, that Emerging Leaders Network group that you had mentioned Uh about a year into the pandemic and that I got asked to speak on authentic leadership. And I'll tell you a little story about that. Uh, the person who asked me to speak was formerly one of my direct reports. Uh, and uh, she, she came to me and she was like, Hey, I would love to have you come speak on authentic leadership. We've got a group of the emerging leaders that are going to get together. Uh, and you'll be one of like a couple of speakers throughout the day. And I was like, that's great. Happy to do it. Like, is there anything you want me to talk about? Or like maybe what sparked you to have um, me come speak to that group? So she comes back and she says, well, there was one Friday uh, where I came in. It was like 830. We had a one on one. Uh, and frankly, you looked awful that day. And I was like, this, this is great already. Please, please keep going. What else do you got here? And she's like, so we started off the conversation. I completely ignored it. It was like five or 10 minutes in. And finally, you were like, ooh, you, you admitted that you were struggling. So that was, it was me. I'm saying like, yeah, I'm, I'm really struggling today. I went to a concert last night. It was great. I, it ended up like at 11 or 11.30. And like, I only got like six hours of sleep. I'm, I'm here. I'm with you. But like, do you mind if we go get some coffee? And she's like, it was at that moment that I knew that you were uh, like, uh, allowing me to be 100% authentic with who I am and the, the types of things that I want. So uh, authentic leadership is probably the way that I would describe my leadership style. Uh, at, that story was done in the office. Uh, since then, to your point, we, we've had a pandemic. I've had to tr figure out how to lead teams remote. Um, one of the things that I guess I, I try and do reasonably well is like I live in the Teams or Zoom chat. Uh, and and most of the time I'm on topic, like asking questions in the chat, trying not to interrupt the speaker's flow. Occasionally uh, I will make a, a side comment, a, a funny comment upon, uh, I'll, uh, I'll poke fun at myself almost all the time, uh, just as, as a way to maybe lighten the mood to try and build a little bit of that um, maybe in office culture that you might've got in between meetings that you just don't get anymore, right? You don't get the, the side, uh, conversations that happened um, in the lunchroom or uh, in the elevator on the way to the office or whatever. So I do try and recreate some of that in the chat. So that's probably one way that like leadership looks a little bit different. For my team specifically though, uh, we typically have an ongoing, um, we use Microsoft Teams, an ongoing Teams conversation uh, about relevant topics, about things that are going on either operationally, um, how sales are doing, uh, we'll bring up strategy topics. Uh, I'll give an example of one that uh, I'm, I'm pretty proud of uh, in moving my team along. So I'm relatively new to the role that you described, Senior Vice President of Income and Wealth Planning. Uh, we had one of my employees, um, their direct report had left, so two levels down for me. Put in their two weeks uh, notice, uh, and then uh, he and I had a, a brief exchange in, in Teams where he's like, hey, Seth put in his two weeks notice. Um, what do you want to do for a backfill? Uh, so I asked like, well, do you have anybody in the, the immediate succession plan? He says, no, not yet. Um, then he specifically volunteers like, oh, we should probably go ask the rest of the like leadership team. Hey, is, there, is there anybody that you all have in mind? Well, that's great. We put it in the team's chat that I mentioned we have going all the time. So 
through that, we have, I don't know, maybe three or four chats. And then finally somebody says, we should just get the team together. So we, we pull together a team meeting. Like already this is going great from a team dynamic standpoint. Like one, uh, we, we reported the problem early. We started talking about immediate solutions. We then opened that up to other people to provide solutions. And then we, we came to the conclusion that we were not gonna solve that in the medium that we were using in Teams. We yeah. needed to actually have a, a as face-to-face -face as you can have in a virtual yeah. world, yeah. a meeting in order to be able to solve that. So it was, that was a great example of, um, you know, the, the type of leadership style that I'm trying to build, which is like, use the multiple mediums of communication that you have raise problems early and then have the conversation that you need to have in, in whatever medium makes sense. So if we could have got together in person, if it's like a bigger strategy thing, which we do a couple of times a year, we will certainly do that. But for the most part, we are really trying to, to lead teams like, again, using the, the tools that are at a disposal, whether that is a, a Zoom meeting like we've got today or whether that is uh, the chat conversation or recreating some of the water cooler moments that, that bury uh, deep in the team's chat while you're in a bigger presentation. Oh, Brian, I absolutely love that because one of the things that I see leaders struggle with is they're not intentional like you are there where you're obviously thinking through which channel actually makes sense. And because I hear a lot of people say right now, oh, my gosh, I've just got back-to-back -back meetings. Everything that used to be a five-minute conversation around the water cooler or just popping by someone's desk in the office turns into a 30-minute meeting. And so my day just gets blocked up. And I love that, though, of thinking, okay, well, how can you think through leveraging teams, et cetera, to go, okay, where's the quick snappy stuff, but also really quickly acknowledging, well, where are the things that you go, actually, we're not going to solve this by just going back and forth in teams. It does need that proper conversation to have. So I absolutely uh, love that. I also love your story about authentic leadership and uh, and the person in your team saying that you uh, look pretty terrible. I had one of them yesterday. I was on a call with a chief people officer and it was early in the day and he said to me, oh, just letting you know, I'm really hung over today. I normally don't drink. And <laughs> I loved it because then we had these jokes throughout about how your energy level's going. Do you need, do you need a break? <laughs> exactly. <And laughs> it just raised the authenticity level completely. And we were able to get through the work side really, really quickly. So I love those examples that you give in there, Brian. Yeah. So once I, you get to Oh, sorry, yeah, Tina. I was going to say, once you get to that level of conversation, right now, you can really separate the work that needs to get done. And yeah. that that becomes clearer than like the personal side of things. And I built a personal connection with you because it, we had that moment of honesty. Yeah. And so now, like when, when we're talking about work things, it becomes less of a, I don't know, a disagreement or like, well, he's asking me to do it because of so and so it's like, no, no, he's just surfacing the problem. Like, we, we actually had we actually have a, a, a good connection, a good personal connection yeah. that I'm not worried about influencing. I can actually talk about the problem in a way that like maybe I disagree with my boss or my direct report, whatever, about the solution to this problem. But because yeah. we have that like emotional connection that we built in that moment of honesty, like we can actually talk about problem and solution separate from that, knowing that that is still going to be there. And we're still going to have that as a, as a strong base to build on. Oh, I love that so much. And I think this is one of the areas that authentic leadership that you mentioned that a lot of people are still unlearning because I know when I'm 48 now, and I remember in my twenties, um, working and I was told you've got to be really professional so you still talk a little bit and find out what people are doing on the weekend or where they're going on holidays but you've got to be really professional and the more time that goes by the more I realize exactly what you said that giving of yourself the good the bad the ugly whatever it looks like uh, absolutely builds that connection but it actually builds that trust and also that leads you to better outcomes and it's better from a work standpoint than if you just tried to be you know this straight laced person who doesn't share of themselves so it's interesting it actually helps productivity as well yeah, that I love that as a as an anecdote. And and to be clear, like we're still pretty professional, right? We're still mm. about the work to make sure that the work gets done yeah. and so on. Like uh I I will typically wear a collared shirt. I don't know, that's probably my own personal bias. I don't really care if any of my team wears t-shirts. Um but like there is there is some like decorum of professionalism that you still got to hold. Absolutely. But but yeah. you can definitely like it um I, I know exactly what you're referring to with that culture of like everything's got to be buttoned up everything's got to be perfect all the time like 
don't let them see you sweat. Like, yeah. no, no, like y'all are going to be in here with me. We're going to actually talk about the problems because I, I need your input and like your buy-in to help solve it. So yeah. you get to see the problem. You get to see the solution, like the the making of how we arrive to the conclusion rather than just this is the way we're going to do it. We're going to talk about, well, we thought about this and we didn't like that. So then we thought about this and we didn't like that. And then finally we landed on this as the best solution. I know it probably doesn't make all of you happy, but now you've at least seen why we chose it rather than just yep. like, ah, we decided this one. Oh, I love that so much. Well, I'd love your thoughts, Brian. Uh, I love asking the question about what are the just two to three leadership skills or competencies that you think that leaders right now in our new world of hybrid work, what are the skills that you think that leaders need to amplify when we're not all in the office together, Monday to Friday, nine to five? Boy, the, I, I think one of the things that I have leaned into since uh, we moved to a hybrid type work environment is being better about uh, writing my thoughts down and then sharing those with the team. So um, I, I throughout the pandemic, uh, I have written a mostly weekly, sometimes bi-weekly uh, newsletter to I don't know, probably a quarter or more of the company, voluntary subscribers. So, yep. and that, that newsletter is on um, technology modernization. You mentioned that as one of my previous roles. I, I still continue to do that uh, in the current role. And we talk about everything from like, uh, we talked about chat GPT uh, a couple of months ago um, when the whole GameStop craze was going on. It, it's a, the US um, real, retail investors were, bidding up GameStop on the stock market. Uh, that was a really fun week to, to try and talk about. We've talked about Bitcoin. We've talked about a whole bunch of fun things, but the, the, act, the things that we talk about isn't really the point of it, right? The point of it is, how do I write this uh, potentially dry topic? Uh, I mean, the stock market's been written about forever. How do I turn this potentially dry topic into something that is compelling, interesting, and then relates to whatever the the task at hand is what is our in my case it was like how do i relate that to either technology that we're working on at mutual of omaha or a strategy concept that i'm trying to get across yeah and like getting better at that writing i think has helped um, me and probably my team better understand the the thought process or why we might be attacking a strategy or a t looking at a technology in a particular way so so one is for me, at least getting better about writing. Two, we already touched on a little bit, which was how do you best use the um, medium to get the message across? Yeah. So I, I recognize that sometimes like a, I don't know, four paragraph email is not the best way to get that across. Or in the example I gave earlier, that a team's conversation is not the best way maybe to make a, a potential decision about what do we want to do about this empty role that that somebody just vacated. Does, yeah. Do we need to find somebody to fill it? Do we like, can we backfill immediately? Uh, that was not the most effective way to solve it. So think about the communication channels where before it might've just been like, well, of course I'll go pop by their desk. Yeah. So in that case, uh, you gave that example of like the things that used to take five minutes, we now book 30 minute Teams meetings or Zoom meetings about. Uh, one of the things that I have tried and taken to is just like send the note in send a one line two two line thing in teams and then just wait for them to get back to you you may want that immediately but many times it's like oh i'll get that answer in like the next hour two hours it'll be fine sometime today is fine if i need it immediately obviously i'll call them or we will set up a meeting whatever but for the most part like i can get a lot of things done via that text medium yeah uh, so those two are are probably the things that i've leaned into the most of thinking about the medium of communication and then uh, getting better at writing to for for everything from like what describe the problem to identify multiple strategic solutions to like relating that to something fun. Oh, I love that so much. Um, thinking about the newsletter type that you get out, the sense of belonging and connection that would come from that, aside from the learning, et cetera, they're the sorts of things that when we are not all in the office together, that can really help people feel connected in with each other. So I think that's wonderful. I love your uh, articulation also on thinking about the medium for how you communicate. I remember many years ago, I was schooled that 
if you are writing an email and you've got a second paragraph there, consider picking up the phone because unless it's something where it is official for approval and you need it in writing going back and forth, that's separate. But if it's just on a typical topic, if you feel you're having to write a thesis, probably not the best thing. And to actually, as I said, pick up the phone or have the conversation uh, to thrash things out. So that intentionality around how you communicate, I think you're absolutely spot on, Brian. It's a really important skill for leaders. And it doesn't take long just to think about ahead of time versus just jumping into the way you've always done that. So I absolutely love that. So I'd love to hear, Brian, your thoughts on what's the best, most practical advice you've ever be, been given about how to work smarter? Boy, I mean, I, to the to the extent that I'm pandering to the host here, one <laughs> of the things that I've heard about it is focus on the outcomes, yeah. right? And if you, if you are focused on the outcomes for your stakeholders, whether the stakeholder is a customer whether yep. the stakeholder is um, an internal party that maybe you get a chance to work with or a regulator, depending on your role. Uh, if you can worry about that and like frame your, your output in the way that they are expecting to see it, you're going to be able to be much more efficient and yeah. uh, effective both in either how you communicate or the work that you do and so on. So uh, an example would be, uh, I, I'm an actuary by background. We didn't get that deep into my, my background history, but uh, that, that role was um, a lot of uh, data polling, data cleansing, some reporting, and then some analysis on it. Uh, what my boss typically asked me to do was do the analysis. Uh, th they didn't typically ask me to do a lot of the data polling. That was just a necessity to get there. Yep. So by focusing on the outcomes, uh, I was like, well, if, if the analysis is the thing that my boss is actually asking me to do, the thing that they care about, how can I automate the other pieces of this? Like that is not that is not something that they care about at all. That's just something that I've got to do to get to the analysis. So I should be focusing as much effort as I possibly can on like looking at that report, trying to figure out what it says, and then asking the next question of like, oh, sales are high in this state like well i wonder why sales are high in this state i wonder if we can figure that out from the rest of the data that we have here like that's the type of thing that my boss would typically ask me to look at so automating the piece that didn't matter that is how i focused on the outcomes right because i could spend more time on the analysis piece and less on the necessity piece of like well i gotta go find this data here i gotta clean it and then i gotta figure out how to report it in a way that that answers the actual question that my boss is asking oh, I one of the ways it. that i've Oh, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but one of the ways that I, I typically tried to find out what my boss was actually asking me was like, all right, what are you going to do with this after I give you the report or whatever that you asked me for? And sometimes it was like, oh, I need to figure out um, how to price this or if I need to go talk to the sales team or whatever the thing was. Uh, so you ask, like, what do you need to do with it? So then I can get an even better picture of like, well, what's the next step in the process? And can I tee my boss up to look good? And if I can do that, like now I've really achieved an outcome that is valuable to my stakeholder in this case, the boss as the example. Oh, that is such a good example. And for people to really think a couple of steps ahead. And I love that around where can you automate uh, or free up time from the non-value added tasks so that your time and your intellect is focused on where the value added tasks are and the things that really actually matter for your, for your customers. I, I love that. Well, Brian, I would love to finish up with some rapid fire questions. Are you open to that? Oh yeah, let's do it. Okay. What's the best purchase you've made for under about a hundred dollars in the last few years? Uh, boy. Probably the best thing that I purchased um, was if you have a car stereo that uses Apple CarPlay, I bought a wireless CarPlay adapter. And that has been a game changer for like making my life so much easier when I get, it, it sounds so dumb. Like I've got the phone in my pocket, I could easily plug in a cord, but like it's so much easier to just like turn the key, have the, have the Apple CarPlay or Android Auto, whichever you've got, show up on the dash and not have to do anything. And now I've got like the full Google Maps. I can, um, yeah, I can listen to like Spotify or whatever your music yep. platform of choice is. Like the, easily under a hundred dollars, 
probably one of the best things I've spent my money on the past few years. I love that because it it takes the friction out. And sometimes yeah. those little bits of friction are enough to go, oh, this is so hard. I love that example. I think there'll be a few people who will be looking to buy one of them. What about what's the book that you've either recommended or gifted most to others? I, I don't think this one is unique, but uh, Thinking Fast and Slow by Kahneman is yep. it, it's great. It's probably the one that I've, I've given the most. For a select audience, um, uh, Fooled by Randomness by Nassim Taleb. Like, yeah. I, I don't know that I would recommend that to everybody, but for, for the folks that are like, yeah, you know what? It is kind of interesting to think about how uh, our world is, is shaped. Um, that, that's a very good book. It's so it, everybody recommends the Black Swan because that was the big one that yeah. like shot him to um, fame, I guess. But I like the one right before that, Fooled by Randomness. Yep, I think it's up there somewhere on my uh, bookcase. Oh, right on. Behind me. Yep, absolutely. And what's the most fearless thing that you've done in recent time? Uh, uh, I went paragliding. So uh, this is the craziest thing I've done. We're like, uh, I've got a, a guide strapped on my back and you're at like the top of a mountain with just a parachute like tied to the guide's back. And he's just like, all right, time to go running. And so you just run as fast <laughs> as you can. Eventually the parachute picks you up and all of a sudden you're just floating. Like, and you are hundreds of feet in the air. It is, it is a crazy, crazy experience. Uh, for sure. The, the most fearless thing I've done. I love that. I've jumped out of a plane, but I haven't done the run off a cliff and, um, and parasail from there. So yeah, yeah. It inspired me. I definitely want to try that one. Yeah. And finally, Brian, I'm keen to hear what does outcomes over hours mean to you? It's delivering what the customer wants as quickly as you can. So we talked a little bit about that already, but what I'm really saying is like the customer doesn't really care about your process. They, they don't care at all. In fact, like the faster you can get through your process, the happier that customer is going to be. Yeah. So it, if it, if it takes you an hour, uh, they're probably going to be disappointed. If it takes you a minute, they, depending on the situation may also be disappointed. Uh, if it's instant, like that is their pinnacle, right? They've asked you to do something. They've asked you to deliver an outcome for them, uh, the fastest you can possibly deliver that. Nobody's going to complain about it. Oh, I love that. Well, Brian, Poppy, thank you so much for being with me on the Outcomes Over Hours show. Tina, this is great. Thank you for the invite. I, I'm so happy to be here.